All right, well, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the study. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can gather uh, this morning. We thank you that you're an awesome God. We thank you that you do not ask us to serve without being the greatest servant of all and meeting every single one of our needs through your death on the cross. Not only that, you washed our feet, Lord. You taught us. You led us. You showed us. And even today, we're going to see that you feed us and you fed us. And so, Lord, may it be that we learn about ministry today through this particular passage in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing I forgot. This is very personal. McKenna, come up here. So I'm going to pray for a second service, but it's my daughter, so I'm going to pray for her first service and second service. Because today, my wife and I, right after second service, are going to be driving up to Waco, and then tomorrow morning we'll be heading up to Dallas with, it, with part of her team to drop them off at the airport for nine months in Greece, ministering to the Syrian refugees and planning a church. And she has no idea everything they're going to do, right? <laughs> so it all, it's all a moving target. And, uh, but she has a great team of about 15 people that will be out there from her church. Uh, she's been uh, fully funded, and, and she's ready to rock and roll and go. And we're just praying about, can we go visit her sometime during the year? <laughs> you know, so we're trying to figure that out. But she will be there until next spring. So we just covet your prayers, and many of you are, are on her prayer list. If not, figure out how you can get on her prayer list, and we just covet your prayers. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's sweet and sour. It's sweet because this is what we raised her to do, and it's sour because we're going to miss her, you know, so much. And, and uh, I always call her my, my boy <laughs> because she's the one that serves with me and plays disc golf and goes running with me and everything else. But she's also very feminine, so she's the full package. <laughs> Dear God, I do just thank you for my daughter. I thank you for your calling in her life, God. I pray that you be with her, that you keep her safe, God, but that she be effective, Lord, that she be wise and innocent at the same time. We pray for the whole team. May they be uni united unified in everything that they do give their leadership lord just vision beyond vision god and i do pray for myself and especially for noreen as uh, this is such an emotional time for us lord and uh, may our fellowship today be sweet as we drive up uh, to waco and uh, we love you lord and again we just thank you for this opportunity lord to give even more unto you in jesus name amen <laughs> How do you teach after that? No, it's kidding. <laughs> All right, so we're in John, and we've been traveling through John. And remember the way that John writes his account of Jesus' life, John's gospel, John's history. He's writing it for a specific purpose, that you may believe, right? That we may believe. And what had happened is he wrote decades after uh, the other uh, gospel writers and the reason um, he wrote it is because people were confusing, uh, were, were being confused on who Jesus really was. Was he God in the flesh, or was he an angel, or just merely a man that had the Spirit of God upon him? And so he makes it very clear. And so he's very specific in the miracles and the signs and the, and the stories that he chooses to tell about Jesus. And so he very much presents him as the Messiah, as God come in the flesh, uh, God incarnate. And so... With that, he, he specifically chooses certain, certain events. And we've been looking at the man who had just been healed in the south in Jerusalem uh, who had been paralyzed for 38 years. And he, and he brought healing to him. And we spent a lot of time looking at all the aspects of that because John specifically wants us to learn a lot from each one of these events. And now we're going to pick up Jesus' ministry when he's more north in the region of Galilee. And so John chapter 6, verse 1 reads this. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And so we're going to be looking at ministry under pressure. And, and so we're going to bring out 11 points about ministry. Some of them are hard things to swallow, but important to know. And, and some of them are just guidelines. And, and the last few are just the radical blessings of serving the Lord. 
And, and so point number one, ministry is often misunderstood. Why do I say that? Well, if you look at this, it says, because of the signs which he performed. Understand, the signs were there for a specific reason, not just to create a show. The signs were there to point to the sign giver, not to the signs themselves. And so they're running after the sign. They're running after the miracle and not the miracle worker. I say this again and again because it's important. Miracles follow believers. Believers do not follow miracles. Believers follow Jesus. Okay? We're at South Padre for our, just, we, we take one night in a hotel and we go to Schlitterbahn one day and the beach the next day down at South Padre. We, we've been doing it for like, I don't know, 15, 16 years since our kids were little. And, and so we're driving on to South Padre Island. And every time we drive on to South Padre Island, there's people out in front of the South Padre Island sign just across the causeway taking pictures. I'm at South Padre Island. So what if they turned around right then and went back across? That'd be a waste of time because they never experienced Schlitterbahn or the beach or uh, the good restaurants out there. and they, they, they wouldn't have experienced it. And so many people were chasing after Jesus merely for the sign. Look, I'm with Jesus. And never got to experience the depth and relationship with Jesus. That's foolish. And so often ministry is, is misunderstood. You know, people will call up the church often and they'll say, um, I have a problem with my um, elect- electricity bill. And we say, okay, well, do you go to church here? And they go, no. And go, well, where do you go to church? I don't go to church. I don't believe in God. And then we ask them, well, you probably should go to church. Why don't you come on Sunday, and then afterwards we'll, we'll connect you with someone that can talk to you about your finances and, and see if we might be able to help. I'm not going to do that. You're just supposed to pay my bill. <laughs> right? We want to introduce them to an eternal Savior, not just pay their bill. See what I'm saying? And, and, and they were just following for the miracle, but not for Jesus, the miracle worker, okay? And, and another thing I, I want to point out here in this particular section is, number two, ministry is rarely convenient. People do not consider what you are personally dealing with. And the fact is, if you want or wait to expect to serve people, serve God by serving people until it's convenient, you're not going to do a whole lot of real ministry. You know, it's funny, my schedule is really flexible, but my schedule belongs to you, right? So you call up, oh, when can I meet with you? I say, well, normally Tuesdays and Thursdays, just call Rosemary. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I don't come in until late because I'm normally here until 10 o'clock. Why? Because you guys work during the day. And you have weird shifts and stuff like that, and I want to meet with you. Sometimes it's 11 or 12 o'clock that I get home. Mondays are my day off. I really protect it, try to spend that time with my wife and catching up on my honeydew list, all that kind of stuff, right? But I'll meet with you on Mondays if I have to. And if that's the only time you can meet, I will meet with you, and I'm not going to go, I can't believe it's Monday. You know, it's just not convenient. You guys don't get sick at the right time. You don't get in car accidents. Your kids don't get arrested at the right time. You know, it's just really inconvenient, you know? And, and it's just a reality. But understand, you know, some of the things that were going on in Jesus' life right now is he had just heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. One, it's a relative. Two, is a prophet, a forerunner to him, the greatest prophet, Jesus said of him. And he had just been beheaded for telling the truth. That's radical, right? And he just sent out his disciples to be on a, uh, on a mission trip, and he gave them authority and power over, uh, over demons and over sicknesses. And so they're going out, and he calls them to side. Hey, let's, let's get aside and, and debrief, and we'll, we'll mourn a little bit over John. Some of these guys were John's disciples before they were Jesus's. You guys realize that, right? John said, go follow him. That's what they're dealing with. And you know what? All these people are crying, give us a miracle, give us a miracle, give us a miracle. And this is at the north end of the lake, a, a city called Bethsaida. It's actually Peter's first hometown. We know later on Peter lived in, in uh, Capernaum. But, but a few miles away on the north end of the lake, it's now inland because of earthquakes and silt and stuff like that. But it was right on the lake. It was a fishing village there. And, and that's where this is occurring. And, and so what's, what's happening is... All these people, it's the time of the Passover, it tells us, 
all these people are traveling from the northern part of the country and they're following down the Jordan River Valley and they would have went through Bethsaida. Oh, that guy, Jesus, we've heard about. He's, oh, let's go see it. Let's go check it out. Let's go watch the circus. And so they're clamoring around. Jesus is mourning. He needs to train his guys. Come on, man. He's taken the plan of history, of all of history, the cornerstone of everything, you know, and, and, and he's laying it on these guys' shoulders, and he's not having an opportunity to minister to them, and he doesn't cuss them out. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't browbeat them. What does he do? He ministers to them. Very often it says that Jesus looks at people and he says they're like a sheep without a shepherd. You see, they had a religious system, but the religious system became so religious, people became rigid. They didn't have the heart of God. They had a heart of stone. And so people would come with knees and they'd just be shoved away. You served those that were supposed to be your servants instead of the other way around. And they were demanded to do so. It had been twisted. And so he looks at them and, 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 and he just sees, oh, they need to be ministered to. Now, if we look at verse 5, It goes on to say, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And so he looks up. Listen, ministry considers others' needs. You think they were hungry? The guys are probably thinking, okay, man, we can sneak away and get some food now. Taco Bell right down the road. Whatever. Whatever. You know, hey, Peter's, Peter has family here. We can go mooch off of them. But what does he do? Jesus considers what other people need. Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let us each esteem others as better than himself. And then it says in verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, it's funny because people will come to me and they'll say, well, you know that verse, you're supposed to serve me. (laughs) You know, but at the same time, if I'm not taking care of myself, I can't take care of you either. But we kind of will use that to say, well, I got to take care of myself and not take care of anybody else either, right? But see here it says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And this is when God grabs your heart and he starts to transform things in your life. You know, and I, and I was just in the announcements, I was talking a little bit about giving unto the Lord. And that's when you start thinking, yeah, I'm going to pay my bills, you know, and yeah, I give to the church, but what about missionaries? And you're thinking about their needs as well, right? And, and you start considering what they also need. And so when you're in ministry, you need to consider other people's needs. And you don't look at other people and you think, you need to consider my needs, right? And that's, we tend to do that, right? I know what the word of God says, pastor. You're supposed to consider my needs, you know? But why don't you turn it around and consider the needs of others, right? Man, if the church worked that way and actually read and did what the Bible said, man, the church would be packed all the time everywhere and the whole world would be evangelized, right? If we just go, oh, wow. So I can take care of my needs, but I also need to consider how I can help you right? And, and so all of us need to have that same attitude. And uh, so Jesus was aware of the situation. He wasn't just consumed with his own hunger, but he was also understanding that other people had needs as well. Then verse 6 goes on, and it says, but this he said to test him, because he himself knew what he would do. So he says to Philip, why did he choose Philip? Philip had a need, right? Philip needed to learn a lesson. He didn't pick on another guy, but this particular lesson was Philip's. And God does specifically speak to us. But he he did this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Number four, in ministry, you will be tested. And what you're tested on is not sin or not sin. You're tested on where is your source? Are, are you looking at your limitations or are you looking at God's limitations when he calls you to do something? How big is your God? You know, God is as big as he is. But what is your concept of how big God is? What do you think God can or can't do? And I get situations and I just look at my own resources and I look at my own, my own personality and I say, I can't do it. 
but I love to watch God do it. You know, people often, over time, you know, you, you, you get in leadership and you end up being judged, right? Just the way it is. And then people look at me and they say, you're such an idiot. And I go, yeah, isn't it amazing? So I embrace that weakness. I'm an idiot, but I embrace that weakness because my God's big. My God is so much bigger than I am, and I don't want to doubt him. How do you pray? You pray big prayers. And so at this point in time, Philip had seen Jesus do so many things. Philip had just gone out and healed people and cast out demons, crazy stuff like, man. And his God is still not big enough because he's still relying on his own resources. He's still relying on his own knowledge. Okay, so you will be tested. We'll talk a little bit more about this. What is a test? A test, excuse me, is to make a trial of for the purpose of ascertaining its quality or what he thinks or how he will behave himself. It's not to be tempted. Sometimes it is to be tempted, but here it's not to be tempted. God doesn't tempt us to sin, but he will test us to give us uh, an understanding of where we're at. You know, every time you step on a scale, it's a test because it tells you where you're at, right? (laughs) Yeah, one leg at a time. Man, I lost a bunch of weight. (laughs) You know, and and, and it it just, it it does put you, it does show you where you're at. Sometimes you'll have a stress test on your heart or having all the 50-year-old tests when I turned 50 a couple years ago, you know. It kind of gives them, uh, it tells you where you are and and what you need to work on, right? And in that way, that's what God does. You guys need to understand something. When we first moved out here, man, I thought I was all that. Young guy, 33 years old, man, you know, six months, 600 people. Six years, 6,000 people. Man, I'm it. And when I got out here, my dad came for the first Easter And shortly after that, he broke his neck. And then 19 months after that, he passed away. My dad was my best friend at the time and my hero of the faith. I know a lot of pastors, but my dad was a school teacher. I don't know any man like my dad, right? And he died. You know, that rocked my world. So now I knew a little bit more where I was at. God got me through it. So my God is big. My God is strong. You know, but for me, it was a test. My dad's in heaven. He's healed. He's complete. Do I really believe that? That's a test. Where's my faith there? Well, that faith passed. But I realized I relied so much upon my father and his approval of me that I wasn't relying upon my heavenly father and his approval of me. And I tell you what, over the years, for crazy reasons, people have decided not to like me. And that lesson that I learned because I trusted in my dad's approval instead of God's, and my dad never disapproved of me, but I learned to trust in God's approval of me. And so still, if someone hates my guts, and I don't know why, it's like I'll have a sleepless night, but the next day I'm normally okay <laughs> because I go back to the fact that, hey, I was weak in that area, and God has now made me strong in that area. So that was a test for me. And, and so you will be tested, but it's okay because you want to know where you're at. Christians deal with truth. When you're not truthful about who you are, you're a hypocrite, right? And we don't want to be hypocrites. You know, there's an older couple who had a son who was still living with them. They're very concerned about this. They're thinking, man, he got to get out on his own. What's going to happen? And, and so they decided to do a test to see where he would be at. And so what they did is, is uh, they, they just left a note, hey, we're going to be gone for a few days. They put a $10 bill, a Bible, and a bottle of whiskey right by the note. Then they hid in the closet waiting for him to come home. Son comes home, he grabs all three, and the father goes, oh no, this is worse than we thought. You know, if he took the $10 bill, we think he'd be involved in finances. You know, if he took the Bible, he's going to be a pastor. If he took the whiskey, oh no, he's going to be a drunkard. This is worse. Now he's going to be a politician. (laughs) Yeah, good election cycle, right? (laughs) So he's not tempting him to do something bad. He's showing him where he's at. And you better believe Philip remembered this lesson, right? We don't know how it served him the rest of his life. He's not the main thrust of of the book of Acts, but for sure God did a ton of things through this very test in his life, and we should also learn from it. 
But you will go through tests, and it's not always easy. Just like it's not convenient, you're going to have your weaknesses revealed to you. But if you really want to serve God, you're going to press through those weaknesses, and he's going to make those weaknesses now strengths. That's a blessing of about, be, about being a servant. And a couple things, you know, a, a teacher will give you a quiz. Why? It reveals how you're doing. How are you doing? And that's what God does in our tests. How are you doing? Paul told us to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Test yourselves. Right? Another reason is it's an incentive to study. It's an incentive to get better. You don't give up on yourself. I didn't give up on myself when I realized, oh my gosh, this rocked my world. I was trusting too much in my dad's approval. But what it did is it caused me to seek God's approval all the more. Right? And that's what tests do. It's an incentive to study, to learn, to become better in that area. Paul tells Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So work hard, present yourself to God to to be more of what he has called you to be. And you don't know unless you're there. At 33 years old, and and if I hadn't been tested and tested so many times since then, I would just be, you know, happy, stupid, prideful, and young, but old, (laughs) right? (laughs) And not learning my lessons. So being tested is hard, but it is important. As a man went to an insane asylum and They showed him the test to see whether people should stay in the hospital or not. And he said, here's what we do. We fill up a bathtub full of water. We lay out a spoon, a teacup, and a bucket. And we tell the person, empty the tub. And so the man who was visiting the insane asylum, you know, thinking, okay, this is a test for crazy people. He goes, of course you're going to use the bucket. It's so much bigger than the spoon in the cup. And the guy looks at him and he says, no, you just pull the plug. (laughs) <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have to stay there. It's just a story. You know, Abraham faced a test. He actually passed that test, right? The test was how far did he trust God? And he proved that he trusts God that even if he put his own son to death, his son would be raised from the dead. That was the promised child that God had given him. And God had said, through you, the nations of the earth would be blessed through that seed. And that seed was Isaac. And he trusted God so much. God didn't want him to kill his son, or else he would have let him. He stopped him, but he said, how far are you willing to go? That was a test for him. And he actually passed it in a good way. One more thing about testing. You know, there was this mother with her four-year-old daughter, and she picked up, the the four-year-old picked up something off the ground. Mother goes, no, no, don't eat that. You don't know where it's been. You know, you don't know who's touched it. You don't know what it is. You don't know what's in it. And and the little four-year-old goes, oh, my gosh, how did you know all this about this little thing that I picked up? You must be really smart. How did you know all this, Mom? And she said, well, you know, whenever you're a mom, you have to take a mommy test. And if you pass the test, and then you can have children. And the little girl looks up her, and she goes, wow. And if you don't pass the test, you become a daddy. <laughs> right? Because we go, just eat it. <laughs> you know, whatever, you know. And so here is Philip, and he's looking at the answer. And he's like, I don't like the answer. We're going to see it's just, you know, a couple dried up salted fish. That's not enough. A few barley loaves. Barley loaves were considered junk food back then. Like, not junk food, good, like bad food, because wheat was better. That was what you fed your animals. And so this little poor kid just had a few salted fish and some barley crackers, basically. And that's all we got. We don't have anything. But the thing is, he didn't consider that he had Jesus. The key to passing God tests is always learning to trust him more. That's how Abraham did it. He trusted beyond his understanding. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Are you willing to take the problem to God and ask him to be a part of the solution and trust him for the answer? And and I dare say, we need to get in that habit because my habit is to try everything else and then go to God as a last resort instead of a first resort. But pray about things first. Make that a habit in your life as you will be tested. And so he asks 
He asks him, Philip, how are you going to do on this test? What? Verse 7, Philip answered and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have a little. <laughs> so he freaks out. He doesn't answer it right. Okay? 200 denarii is $20,000. There's, the crowd is so big, we're not even going to be able to get a snack in everybody's mouth for $20,000, equivalent for today. So listen, you're not always going to do the right thing in ministry. Sometimes you'll do the wrong thing, which gives you freedom. If you know you're not always going to do the right thing, it gives you freedom to be honest about how it turned out. I've been in ministry a long time, 28 years. And four of those years, I was on staff as an assistant pastor. Four years prior to that, I was in leadership as a servant leader in that church, a lay leader in that church. And I got to see a lot of people call a failure a success when everybody in the room knew it was a failure. (laughs) And I'm like, that's wrong. You're, You're calling it a success, but it was a failure. And then I saw people like, You know, the pastor said, well, how many people showed up? And this guy would say, 50. And five showed up. And they had to be there. I'm like, why don't you just say five? Listen, the disciples failed again and again and again, and we have churches named after them. It's okay (laughs) to not always be a success. You are not expected to be. You know, one of the things in this church is we're pretty real, right? We're pretty raw. And, And... we, we, don't, we don't pretend to be polished, and the reason is we're not polished, right? I mean, you guys can come here and grow up in this church. That's what we want you to be. We don't want you to come in and act like you're perfect from the beginning because you're not. And I know this because all your elders are a bunch of mess-ups, and so is your pastor. So all the elders' wives are going, amen, pastor, you know? <laughs> We're normal people doing a spectacular thing. And since we're normal people doing a spectacular thing, God gets the glory. Right? Oh, I love that. You will not always do the right thing. Don't be afraid to try, though. Because God gives you credit for trying. Now, what should have Philip said as the right answer? Something like this. Master, I don't know where the food is to feed this crowd. But you are greater than Moses, whom God used to feed a multitude every day in the wilderness. And God can certainly do a lesser work through a greater servant, you. You're greater than Elijah, who God used to feed many sons of the prophets with little food. And you tell us man shall not live by bread alone. And you're great enough to fill this multitude with words from your mouth. Right answer, good answer, right? You didn't have to answer it just like that. But there's other ways. Jesus, I don't know, but you do. And I'm here to find out what you want me to do. Right? That's all he needed to say. But he said, no, it's impossible. (laughs) You know, you're, you're you're talking to God in the flesh. And so the question is, do you really trust God? At this point, he, didn't tr- he trusted him to a point, but not so far. Be humble. Do not return evil for evil. Is that hard to do? When God says be humble, and you're at the workplace, and someone's being arrogant, and it seems like they're being lifted up, and God says be humble, God opposes the proud, but exalts the humble. Many places it says things like that. So when someone's attacking you and you're not attacking them back, returning evil for evil, do you really believe that God can bless you in that? Or do you return evil for evil? Or do you get on Facebook and start saying stuff? Do you attack back? Oh, man, it's so hard, but you know what? That's where my peace comes from. And I get attacked for the stupidest things. And many of them are just misunderstandings. And no one will talk to me. And, and I just got to stand back and go, okay, God, you oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Lord, if I'm humble, you'll lift me up in due time. God, it doesn't matter how big the church is. Even if it splits a thousand times, as long as I'm faithful to what you told me to do, I'm faithful. That's all I need to do. 
and people can say anything they want. But ultimately, in the end, I'm not going to return evil for evil, and I'm going to put that flesh down, and I'm going to present it to you, God, and and you shut my mouth, and and you take back all those evil thoughts that have come into my mind now, and I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to return evil for evil. Right? That's what you do. Do you trust God enough to do that? That's where the rubber meets the road, right? Because you're thinking, well, next time there's 5,000 men and maybe... 10,000 more kids and women, you know, I'll remember that. No, it's a day-to-day thing. It applies all the time. Do you trust God enough to give a gentle answer to your wife who just lost it in your face? Do you trust God enough to look at your husband and not disrespect him even though he's being disrespectable? Right? Do you trust him? Do you believe it? Oh, now you're, now you're messing, Pastor. Yeah, I'm messing. I want to mess with you. I want you to live it. And so you want to improve, and you want to trust God every step of the way. Do you really trust God in the small things so that he can give you the bigger things? Now, moving on to verse 8, it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves, junk food, and two small fish, probably salted dried fish, But what are they among so many? Listen, ministry is for the willing and the available. The kid comes up and he's willing to give away his lunch. Is he hungry? He's hungry too, right? And that's all they got. Ministry is for the willing. You might think, man, all I got is some junk food, some dried up salty fish. You know, Elvira, you're lucky. I have this picture of you and Noreen eating Peter's fish at that restaurant when we're in Israel. I almost put it up on the screen. Maybe second service. I don't know. (laughs) But the fish, what I'm saying, though, is not very big. It's just a a small, small fish, you know. And uh, um, so this is what they have. But he is willing to give it. This young boy doesn't have a a college degree, but God's going to use him greatly. This young boy doesn't have lots of money, but God will use him greatly. This young boy is a young boy. He's not that smart. He doesn't have that much information. He's just a young boy. He's willing. He may not be born into the right family, but he's willing. You know, faithfulness is so much better than talent in the church. Because faithful people, man, if someone's talented and just not there, it doesn't do any good. Faithfulness is so much better. And oftentimes, talent brings pride, right? (laughs) Got to be careful of that. So it takes a person that's willing just to say yes to Jesus, and that's the person he'll use. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Small boy with his lunch. It's not much, but here it is. And God doesn't need much. In fact, God doesn't need any help, but he chooses to use us, right? He chooses to use us. He wants to use us. Now, verse 10 goes on in John 6, and it says, And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the man sat down in number about 5,000. So they broke the groups into smaller groups, says Mark. And it says 5,000 men specifically in Matthew. So 10,000 plus people they're going to feed with, with these meager with this meager lunch then verse 11 goes on and it says and jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down likewise of the fish as much as they wanted point number seven i bring this up often but those ministering see the miraculous those just eating didn't see it it's all about me but the ones serving and waiting to eat and taking care of other people and They're going, oh my gosh, uh, keep on eating. There's more. They get to see it. And that's one of the greatest blessings of ministry. You get to see people's lives change. If you never minister to someone's life, you never get to see their life change. If If you never serve other people, you never get to see their lives change. If you never stepped out on faith, you don't get to see God answer that faith. Everyone ate and was filled. That is a miracle, and those that were serving others got to see the miracles. So those closest to Jesus and those willing to do the work. Point number eight is also found here. Ministry is Jesus and the power and the wisdom of God. It's about Jesus. 
the disciples didn't do the miracle. They distributed the miraculous work of Jesus. And that's why it's so fun for me to get over my head ministry. Because I'm not, com- it's not coming from me. It's coming from the Lord. And when you sit down in counseling and a couple walks in and they're hating each other and spitting daggers at each other through their looks, and they leave holding each other's hands. And after three hours of just sweating through crazy counseling, they leave. And I don't go out and go, I'm awesome. I need to write a book about that. I go, I sit there and I go, God is good. God is good. God can change sinners' hearts to be holy, which is the greatest miracle ever. God gives us this incredible, powerful thing called grace that we can show towards one another. It's not natural, is it? And forgiveness, it's not natural, is it? But he gives it to us, man, and we can apply it. Wow, it's about Jesus and his work. We're not the answer. We're not the healing. We're not the wisdom. We're not the rescue. We just have the blessing of distributing his goodness to others. Listen, all a teacher is, is a guy with a basket handing out the bread of God. And I always tell people, being a pastor isn't rocket science. Oh, but pastor, you're so wise. I'm not wise, guys. Interesting thing about teaching the Bible, it makes you look really smart. And a lot of times you'll say, oh, good sermon, pastor. I'll say, had good material, right? (laughs) Because it's not out of this ADD brain. And if something wise comes out of this ADD brain to, to talk about the word of God, it's normally on the fly, nothing I thought about because the Holy Spirit is involved and wants you to learn, not make me look good. It's not about me looking good. It's about you learning. And, and, and so it's miraculous. Live that way, man. It is miraculous that God would ever use you. And point number nine is ministry satisfies the servant as well as the served. The coolest thing about ministry, it's satisfying. It's a blessing. And many people don't get to be engaged in it because they're not going to step out. I can't do anything. Can you turn a knob? right? He'd be in the sound ministry. And, and, and God, God uses everybody. He wants to use everybody. What about the little boy? He gave up his lunch and was able to eat much more than he had brought with him. He was stuffed too. He sacrificed his whole lunch and he got to eat like a smorgasbord of way more. Probably tasted better too, right? Because it went through the miracle. I don't know, you know? But you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. God. Verse 12, it says, So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Number 10, Ministry reveals the generous character of God. I love that. Because not only did he meet their needs, he went above and beyond their needs, didn't he? He multiplied so there was 12 baskets, large baskets, the word in the Greek means, left over. Proverbs eleven twenty four. there's one who scatters yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. And I always tell people, I I live a rich life. I live a very rich life. Now, my life was, you know, set to work in the clothing industry within surfing and and sports clothing. And that was my world. That was my early training. And being that very few people graduate with a sports marketing degree and having the connections I had, I might be bringing down half a million dollars a year right now. But I'm richer because God told me to do something, and I was obedient to that call. Because now I have children that love the Lord, and and, and we've been able to affect people in the tens of thousands. We we have a listenership of about 10,000 people on our radio station. And then our church, I always say, we're the smallest megachurch you've ever been a part of. Because Corpus Christi is so transient, we send so many people through here, but just a little bit of discipleship happens here, and we're a part of their story all over this country and all over the world. And we have people that watch our feed. 
missionaries and all over the place that watch. And this is funny. I just laugh. It's weird. But because we moved to Corpus and we struggled and could barely pay our bills and many months couldn't, and then a check would show up in the mail for five and a half years of the ministry here. Yeah, you're shaking your head, right, Carrie? Do you remember those days, the freak-out times? We, we, we're, we're going home, back to California. Tails between our legs, we failed. And then the check shows up. Man, now i got to keep on surfing these waves out here, you know? <laughs> I don't get to go back to my home surf breaks or whatever, you know? But God was faithful, and we've seen riches that aren't financial. We've seen riches that no one can take away that when the stock market fails, are still there. We are so blessed. We have not outgiven God. Us moving out here, God didn't owe us anything. Us leaving our family behind, God didn't owe us anything. Me leaving a cush job, God doesn't owe, owe us anything. But he still blessed me way beyond what I deserve. You can't outgive him, and he is very generous. And then finally, point number 11, ministry brings revelation. When you serve God, you get to know more about God, and he reveals his character to you, and it's a huge blessing because you grow in maturity and understanding of who he is. You do. When you serve God, you start to grow more. And when it's sacrificial, when it's hard, when there's bumps in the road, you get revelation about Jesus. Because while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And we complain because someone's problem isn't convenient for our time schedule. Right? Right? Man, you learn so much more about how much God loves you when you serve other people. There's revelation. Why do I say this? Because all of a sudden they're seeing the miracle and they're going, this is the prophet, the prophet, the Messiah. That's what that meant. Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. This was prophecy about Jesus. And when they said the prophet, revelation. They're beginning to get it, at least those that were willing to serve got it. How are you doing in your tests? Do you tend to bail on your responsibility when like gets uncomfortable? Wow, that, that's bad typing on my part. Sorry. Um, <laughs> they are already stressed and tired, yet they get up to do a little more, and they're blessed in doing so. Also, they were feeding others, but they had their own needs met. They didn't have to go to Taco Bell down the road, right? They had the bread and the fish. They had fish tacos. Awesome, right? Um, <laughs> but what has God been saying to you? Do you entertain going over your head with Jesus, or do you actually put yourself in a place where you might go over your head with Jesus? You know, do you have a nice home that you want to commit to the Lord? Do you need to open it up for a coin and a fellowship? Oh, but man, every other week, that means we'll have to clean the house. And oh, that's rough. Okay. Maybe you need to clean the house every other week. But <laughs> I don't know. But sometimes we think about it and go, no, I can't do it. No, you can. If God's laying it upon your heart, you can serve. Oh, I can't lead a group. Yeah, you just won't ask him to facilitate. I can't disciple anybody. Yeah, you can. You've been walking with the Lord for five years, man. You've got five years on a lot of people. Are your meager assets, talents, possessions, gifts enough when you put Jesus in the mix? You plus Jesus is powerful. You plus Jesus can do it. You alone cannot. And what have you learned about Jesus? Are you going to pass the test? Do you trust him to pray big prayers? Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you again for your word. Lord, you are awesome. You're such a good God. You bless us beyond what we deserve. Lord, may we in this church get it about service. And Lord, those that serve, Lord, may we understand even the more the blessing that it is to serve. May complaint not be a part of our heart, we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.